So the concern with putting a nuke at the center of your asteroid or digging it in and, and, and blowing it up is that depending on the results, um, you might end up blowing it apart, but not enough to keep it from just kind of coming back together. I'm very pleased today to be speaking with Andy Rivkin. He's a planetary astronomer at Johns Hopkins uh, University Applied Physics Laboratory and the investigation lead of the double asteroid redirection test, which is also known as DART. Um, so very excited to talk to you about all things asteroid today. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, you know, we've had this last year where there's a lot of kind of apocalyptic thinking about what can <laughs> happen on Earth, the earthly dangers that we all face um, as an asteroid scientist. I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. Really in the grand pantheon of uh, doomsday scenarios, I don't think you can beat asteroids. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about your work and how DART is one of these missions that's sort of trying to pave a way to trying to prevent uh, a, a collision course with Earth? Up till now, um, we haven't had too many options for what we might do if we found something that was incoming. DART is kind of the first, the first test of how we might be able to deflect something uh, without having to resort to a nuclear package or uh, just kind of sitting in our in our basements and uh, kind of waiting it out and, and crossing our fingers. So. Um, DART specifically is going to be uh, basically a test of what we call a kinetic impactor, uh, mm -hmm. which means that we're going to take our spacecraft and we're going to ram it into an asteroid. And we're going to use the momentum that we bring in with us to um, slightly change the orbit around the sun. Um, well, in, in the case of a real impact, we would slightly change the, the orbit around the sun. In this particular case, since we're doing a test and we don't want to kind of, you know, really do this for real, we're going to hit the moon of an asteroid and we're going to mm. change the orbit of the moon going around the main body just a little bit. So what's the asteroid system, this binary system? Where Where is it in our solar system? And uh, when is DART launching toward it? The uh, system we're going to visit, uh, visit maybe a, a bit more violent than, than a visit exactly, <laughs> yes. um, is uh, called Didymos. Uh, the main body is also called Didymos. The moon is called Dimorphos. Dimorphos is what we're going to hit. Uh, it orbits between the Earth and the main asteroid belt. It doesn't come as close in as the Earth, so it is no uh, no threat to us. Its, its orbit doesn't cross the Earth's. Um, and we are supposed to launch uh, this summer. Our launch window opens as early as July. Because of COVID and other reasons, we might not launch at the very start of it, but we right now uh, are shooting to launch in August. And then how long would it take to get to the Didymus system? Our impact date uh, with Didymos is uh, either going to be the very end of September or the very start of October 2022. I mean, it's just like this is one of my favorite upcoming missions. It's so interesting to think of impacting. And, we, you know, we've had these um, uh, asteroid missions that are very cool going out and grabbing a bit of a, an asteroid and coming back. And but to the idea of actually, you know, punching one a little bit so that it's uh, it, its trajectory changes is just fascinating. What uh, will you be looking for? Actually, even before I get to that point, could you just like describe <laughs> how we're going to hit this thing? I mean, what's the impactor like? And, and does it as soon as it arrives, does it hit it? I just want to know everything about that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we're going to be coming in at a speed of something like six and a half or seven kilometers per second. Wow. So um, that's fast enough to... I, I, I should have done the math ahead of time, and I don't know if I could do it in my head. Fast enough to cross the country in a very small amount of time. <laughs> uh, to go from good. LA to New York in, yeah, 5,000 divided by six seconds. Um, <laughs> uh, so we, we come in at uh, something like six and a half or seven kilometers a second, depending on the exact impact uh, date. Uh, and then uh, that's obviously much too fast for someone to sit there with a with a joystick and kind of steer in. So right. we have a uh, onboard uh, autonomy, basically uh, an, an algorithm that uh, takes images from the camera. We have one instrument; it's a camera, uh, and it's a camera very much like the camera that's on board the New Horizons mission that visited Pluto. 
<laughs> so it takes these images, it sends them to uh, the algorithm. The algorithm says, okay, that's where I should be aiming. And I'm gonna steer a little bit, I'll steer a little bit, I'll steer a little bit. Uh, it's gonna send those images back to Earth where we're also gonna use them uh, after the fact. And uh, just in the last few minutes, um, maybe up to an hour, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it takes itself in uh, to impact. A few days before that impact, though, we are going to jettison a CubeSat, which is being built by the Italian Space Agency uh, called LeechaCube. And LeechaCube's job is to not hit Didymos or not hit Dimorphos like we are, but instead to kind of watch us come in, watch the, the mess we make, so to speak. Uh, watch, <laughs> take, take a look at the plume uh, of debris that we kick up, because uh, that'll tell us about the surface. Uh, and then turn around and take a look at the side of Dimorphos that we're not going to see since we're just on a one-way trip. Um, so between all of these things, between the, the data sent back from that, uh, from that CubeSat uh, and the images that Dart sends back all the way up until, you know, as, as, as long as it can, uh, we'll get a good sense of the shape of, of Dimorphos and the shape of Didymos. Uh, and that'll help us understand things like you know, did we hit a rock? Did we hit a flat area? Did we hit the side of a of a of a cliff? Um, and give us the kind of information we need to really interpret uh, what we've done. So uh, once we impact, um, there's still plenty of work to do. the The spacecraft itself will be will be gone. If we're still hearing from the spacecraft afterward, then then we've got a problem. Um, <laughs> but uh, astronomers on Earth then are going to go to their telescopes and we're going to look at Didymos, and by watching its brightness change um, and looking at the, the pattern of how the brightness changes, we'll be able to tell what we did to the orbit of Dimorphos. So there will be some variability you expect depending on where the impactor uh, lands in terms of what the geography, the local kind of geological makeup of that area is. Yeah, some of the work uh, that we've been doing uh, in advance of, of this, you know, we have we have people whose specialty is looking at, uh, you know, what if you what happens when you hit things with other things, and <laughs> so, you know, we've never done an impact at this scale. Um, people go into their laboratories and they can fire pellets into into bricks, um, but we've never taken something, you know, a spacecraft a meter or two meters apart across and shot it at a at a at an asteroid that's 150 meters across. And what's the sort of predictive range of how much uh, the orbit will change? Is it going to be quite slight? Dimorphos is moving about 25 to 50 centimeters a second in its orbit around Didymos. Okay. Uh, we expect to change that by something like half a millimeter a second. Okay. So it's not a very fast change, but it builds up. And so um we expect uh that to change the the orbit period around uh didymos by up to 10 minutes or so wow um, and also even though that's not a very a very big um change in the speed if dimorphos were coming our way and we had to uh had to deflect it uh a change of that even just a, a millimeter a second or so would allow it to miss the Earth if we did it enough ahead of time. If we did it 10, 20, 30 years ahead of time, it would that would be enough to make it miss. So this is all part of, maybe this is a, a, an answer to a, to a different question, but, you know, DART is an important piece of a kind of a planetary defense strategy, but so is going to the telescope and finding objects early uh, so that we have the time to do something like DART. If we know something's going to hit 50 years from now, we would have enough time to, to use this technique. And that's because you're saying there's sort of a cumulative effect uh, over time with changing the orbit just a tiny bit that's going to allow it to not be hazardous to Earth. Absolutely. If you uh, imagine if you're driving a car and you can see someone coming up on the crossroad you're at, if you notice it two seconds ahead of time, you really have to slam on the brakes. But if you notice it far ahead of time, then you can change your speed just a little bit and, and be fine. That's fascinating stuff. And, you know, as someone who uh, tends to catastrophize about very unlikely events such as asteroid strikes, 
it's a balm to my soul to know that this work is going on. So there could be this whole series of missions that is just going out there and knocking out asteroids and seeing what happens and and, uh, building from there. Yeah, certainly in terms of the kinetic impactor, uh, I know there are other techniques that people have discussed that um, could also be um, be tested. There's one called the gravity tractor, uh, mm-hmm. which is um, they were hoping to test back when uh, the plan was to send astronauts to an asteroid. One of the uh, component missions was um, to to pick up a boulder from an asteroid and hold it really close to the asteroid and you actually would use the gravity of uh, the spacecraft to tug on the asteroid itself and slowly change its orbit. Um, That is uh, obviously more suitable for smaller objects Mm -hmm. uh, and it also takes a longer time to move things. But um, on the other hand, it also would at least potentially allow a more precise placement instead of saying, okay, we're going to come in and and whack this thing and it's going to end up where it ends up to be able to say, we're going to slowly and continuously move this object to where we want it to be. Um, So that is uh, mature enough to be tested. When people think about uh, nuking an asteroid, they're going to think of the science fiction versions, Armageddon. You don't have to worry about me and my team. We'll get the job done. Why is that not the best idea to just blow up the asteroid? Why you'd want to redirect it instead? So the concern with putting a nuke at the center of your asteroid or digging it in and, and, and blowing it up is that depending on the results, um, you might end up blowing it apart, but not enough to keep it from just kind of coming back again. And mm-hmm. if you don't change the the direction of the center of mass and all you've done is spent a nuke on re on, on scrambling what you had and it's still going in the same direction so um those times that people talk about um or you know maybe you do get them to not quite come together but now instead of one thing heading your way you've got two or three things that are only a little bit smaller that are still going to hit um actually i think that happened in the movie deep impact now that i think about it One piece went away and the other one didn't. Um, so if in those cases where we do think about dispersing uh, an asteroid, we really, you, the, the, the imagine, we imagine that it would be in a case where you know you can really pulverize and disperse it so that, so that you know that you're not just gonna, gonna hit the earth with a bunch of stuff, that you're really dispersing it so it doesn't hit. Speculatively speaking, if there was a one kilometer scale kind of uh, asteroid uh, that was on a collision course, at this point in time, would we be able to do anything about that? Or is the technology not quite there for a redirect of that nature? Well, again, it kind of depends on how much warning we have. So if we, you know, if we said this is going to be a one kilometer object and it's going to hit us in the year 2300, then yeah, we definitely have time. If it's, you know, coming in... 2023, then um, I could imagine that we would we would kind of throw our you know throw our efforts at at, at something. Uh, it would be nuclear, uh, you know, using using nukes to um, probably detonate off to the side and and try to vaporize some of the asteroid and use that vapor to to move it. Uh, so not what uh, you know folks in the movies tend to, to use their nukes to do. Um, right. But, um, you know, certainly we would we would try, and I've certainly even seen talks about kind of a last ditch. You know what what we would do if if we had very limited time. Um, so we would we would try something, but again, there's no no evidence that anything of the sort is is on on the horizon or or anything we need to worry about. Well, I really appreciate you sharing. Uh, you know calming my soul about asteroid impacts, but also sharing the uh, amazing uh, scientific side of them, uh, uh, you know, as opposed to just their reputation as dinosaur killers. <laughs> Absolutely. If, if, if asteroids are to keep you awake at night, uh, let it be with, with excitement about how cool they are and not, uh, not concerned.